welcome the board members, uh, the audience in the room, and the audience at home watching via live stream. Uh, Michelle? Sorry, you're up. <laughs> Good morning, everyone. Oh, is it on? I think so, yes. <laughs> uh, meetings of the Industrial Hemp Advisory Board are open to the public and comply with the Bagley Peen Open Meeting Act. This act allows the public to comment on all agenda items. Audience members may address the board following each item, uh, agenda item. Please step up to the podium and use a microphone when doing so. All speakers of the audience are limited to three minutes to ensure that everyone who wishes to comment have an opportunity to do so. Are there any members of the pub public that require accommodation in order to participate in this meeting today? Please raise your hand. No? Okay. All right, we do request that all attendees sign in. The sign-in sheet is right at the entrance to the auditorium. It's not mandatory for attendees to sign in to participate in a public meeting. It simply helps with the minutes and communications to interested parties. Uh, we'll now do a roll call. Um, we'll go down the list, just raise your hand and uh, say your name. Uh, I'll start with me, though. Uh, I'm here, uh, Lawrence Serpman. I'm on the board of directors of the Hemp Industries Association, and I'm the president of the company Hemp Traders. Matt McLean, founder, recreator, hemp apparel, board member, California Hemp Foundation. Valerie Milano, Cal Poly Pomona. Van Buttick, Cooperative Extension, UC Berkeley. Tom Pierce, manager, West Island Cotton Growers, uh, Cooperative uh, Cotton Ginning Business in the San Joaquin Valley. Dave Robinson, Kings County Sheriff, representing the California State Sheriff's Association. Richard Soria, retired horticulture instructor from Cabrillo College and a current pest control advisor. Joshua Chase. Joshua Chase with Kumbaya Farms. Joshua Kress, I'm the program manager for CDFA's Nursery Seed and Cotton Program. Michelle Phillips, CDFA. All right, thank you everyone for attending. Uh, each board member should have a personalized folder with handouts. Copies of the agenda are available for audience members. All handouts will be brought up on the screen up here, and copies can be provided after the meeting upon request. Okay, uh, does anyone need a moment to re review the agenda that we have? Let me just take maybe one minute uh, as we've got a lot of papers real fast. All right, basically we're going to be uh, reviewing and approve the minutes from the August 22nd, 2018 board meeting. You will be uh, review and approval of methodology and procedures to amend the list of approved um, of seed cultivars. We will be discussing the definition of destruction as used in FAC 81006. We'll be discussing crop destruction responsibilities and procedures, and we will be discussing sampling responsibilities and procedures. So we've got quite an agenda today. Uh, we'll also be discussing the definition of tetrahydrocannabinol, or THC, and discussing on the development of the agricultural pilot program that was a part of, I believe, SB uh, 1409. Uh, we will discuss the changes to state and federal laws and identification of future board actions. We will discuss a proposal of amendments to the list of approved seed cultivars. And then uh, after all that, we will have public comments and then discuss when we'll have our next meeting in the agenda. Yeah. Um, I, don't, I don't know if the changes in state law would change our discussions on these other issues, but would it make sense to talk about that first? Or do the changes not impact issues three, four, five, six, seven, and eight? Um, so I think they do impact those, but we've already had discussions on those people that are presenting. I think they've already incorporated that into what they'll be talking about today, so I think we should be good. But we can address those as they come up. 
All right, the board member list is also posted on our website. Please check for any corrections. Um, a few housekeeping uh, items. Uh, if you need to use the restrooms, it's uh, to the left if you go out uh, these auditorium doors. Uh, the first two doors on the right are the men's, the women's is down the hall and around the corner. Um, also, there's water bottles available for, um, for everyone. Please let us know if uh, we run out. And also, and in case of an emergency, please exit through the front and go across to the park. All right, a uh, quick note on public comments. Uh, we will have the opportunity for public comments throughout the meeting as well as an opportunity for general comments at the end. For comments during an agenda item or pending board motion, please keep comments pertinent to the item or motion. At the end of the meeting, we will have the opportunity for additional comments related to the meeting and for items not on the agenda. We do request that all individuals who would like to comment on the agenda item to come up to the podium over here and use the microphone. We also request for each speaker to state their name and affiliation before commenting. Uh, due to the large number of attendees, we will be limiting all commenters to three minutes unless there are follow-up questions from the board. We will be timing all commenters and we'll try to provide warning prior to the time limit ending. Thank you for your consideration as we try to provide everyone with the opportunity to comment during the proceedings. If you have additional questions for the CDFA regarding industrial hemp and the industrial hemp program, please direct your questions to the CDFA staff. You may contact them by emailing industrialhemp at cdfa.ca.gov or calling 916-654-0435. Uh, one thing to mention, we will be breaking for lunch uh, at approximately uh, 12 to 1. So, um, and then we'll also uh, schedule some breaks in between each agenda item. All right. The uh, first item on the agenda is the review and approval of minutes from the August 22nd, 2018 form, uh, board meeting. Uh, the, uh, in the uh, folder here, so we'll give the board just a moment to review those notes. While the board is uh, reviewing the minutes, um, is Don Land?
All right, who's here for one kind of moment uh, to review the minutes? I know it seems like we have a lot of pages here. All right, uh, would anyone like to make any uh, changes or corrections to the minutes of, as they have been presented? All right, no, all right. Um, I'll make a motion to accept the minutes of the August 22nd, 2018 meeting as uh, presented. Uh, does anybody second that motion? All right, Josh seconds it. And uh, anyone we need to make any further discussion about the notes? No. Nope. Uh, do we have any public comments about uh, the notes from the August 22nd meeting? Nope. Okay, so all in favor of accepting uh, the notes say aye. Aye. Anyone opposed, uh, say nay. Okay, the, uh, uh, the motion passes and the, the notes are approved. Did anyone abstain? Uh, okay. okay. <laughs> Good with that. <laughs> Thank you. Question. <clears throat> with all these pages, would it be possible that we get the minutes like a week ahead of time so we can review them? Uh, yeah, I, I, I do agree. I think we got them, what, yesterday or the day yeah. before? Yeah. yeah, that is the goal. It didn't happen this time. Um, so, yeah, before the next meeting, actually, what we'll, we were planning on proposing is that for the, so we're two meetings behind. So for the last meeting, um, we do have a draft that's being finalized right now, and so we will get that out to the board as well as we'll, what we'll do is we'll post that um, for the public as a draft um, prior to the meeting, and we'll go ahead and post that um, as soon as that gets done. And then, yeah, we um, have been able to, um, we were offered some assistance in getting those caught up. So we'll take advantage of that and try to get these minutes out as soon as possible, too. Although, as you can imagine, I'm guessing today's minutes will be quite long um, with the length of the meeting. All right, next up on the agenda is to review an approval of methodology and procedures to amend the list of approved seed cultivars. All right, uh, I think discussion led by uh, Joshua Kress. Yeah. <clears throat> Thank you. So um, at the last meeting, we had discussed that, um, you know, we had had some previous discussion on the, on recommendations to amend the list of approved seed cultivars that's listed in uh, the Food and Agricultural Code. <clears throat> and it was discussed at the last meeting that we needed to first, um, as is written in the law, establish a methodology and procedure for adding, amending, or removing a seed cultivar from that list, um, updating that list. And so we put together, based off of the board's um, previous discussions, a methodology and procedure that we felt would meet the, um, the board's intention on assuring that we have um, public input into this process, um, as we've discussed before. The updating of this list is exempt from the Administrative Procedures Act, um, so it does not require the traditional 45-day comment period and OAL review and things like that. Um, but we did still want to make sure that this was still a public process and did still have um, did still have that component. So what I'm going to do um, this was included in the <clears throat> uh, with the agenda posting that was posted, I believe, 30 or slightly over 30 days ago. And so uh, I'm going to read through it really quickly, and then if we have any further comments um, or discussions from the board, um, we can do that quickly, and then we'll open it up for public comment as well. Um, so we are proposing to establish Section 4921 in the California Code of Regulations, uh, methodology and procedure to update the list of approved seed cultivars. Again, I'll read through this quickly. It's been posted online, but we'll go ahead and read through it for the public record anyway. Um, so the Secretary adopts the following methodology and procedure to add, amend, or remove a seed cultivar from the list of approved seed cultivars. <clears throat> Number one, upon request from the Chair of the Board or of any four members of the Board, the Department shall schedule a public hearing to consider a proposal to update the list of approved seed cultivars by adding, amending, or removing seed cultivars. A notice and text of the proposal shall be made available to the public no less than 30 days prior to the hearing. 
a public hearing to consider a proposal to update the list of approved seed cultivars shall be part of a regularly scheduled meeting of the Industrial Hemp Advisory Board, as we're doing today. The, the public hearing shall include pre presentation of the proposal to update the list of approved seed cultivars, presentation of the purpose for the update, and an opportunity for public comment pursuant to section 11125.7 of the Government Code, um, which is the um, Bagley Keen Open Meeting Act public comment uh, section provision. Uh, after receiving comments from the public, the board shall vote to accept, amend, amend and accept, or deny a proposal for recommendation to the secretary. Upon recommendation by the board to adopt a proposal and approval by the secretary, the department shall amend the list of approved seed cultivars and shall submit the amended list to the Office of Administrative Law to be filed promptly with the Secretary of State. Pursuant to section 81002 of the Food and Agricultural Code, the pro proposal shall not be subject to further review. The department shall post the list of approved seed cultivars to its website and shall provide electronic and or mail notification of amendments to the list of approved seed cultivars to parties that have requested notification. An interested party may go to the department's website and elect to receive automatic notifications of any changes to the list of approved seed cultivars via an electronic mail listserv. Um, currently that would be our standard industrial hemp listserv, however we do receive a lot of um, interest in the public to only receive updates regarding the list of approved seed cultivars and not other things, we can set up an additional listserv just for that purpose as well if that's requested. <clears throat> Section B, um, amendment to, of the methodology procedure. Um, we wanted to make sure we were clear on how this procedure itself would be amended as well. Um, so number one, by motion, the board may recommend amending the methodology and procedure in subsection A. In consultation with the board, the, with the chair of the board, the department shall schedule a public hearing to consider the recommendation and a notice and text of the proposed amendment shall be made available to the public no less than 30 days prior to the hearing. <clears throat> Again, that's the procedure that we follow for this meeting and, and for this agenda item. The public hearing to consider a proposal to amend the methodology procedure shall um, be part of a regularly scheduled meeting of the Industrial Hemp Advisory Board. <clears throat> the public hearing shall include a presentation of the proposal to amend the methodology and procedure, a presentation of the purpose of the, for the amendment, and an opportunity for public comment, um, as mentioned before, pursuant to the uh, Bagley Keen Open Meeting Act. After receiving comments from the public, the board shall vote to accept, amend, and accept, or deny the proposal for recommendation of the secretary Upon recommendation by the board to adopt the amendment and approval by the secretary, the department shall amend the methodology and procedure and shall submit the amended methodology and procedure to the Office of Administrative Law to be filed promptly with the Secretary of State. Pursuant to Section 81002 of the Food and Agriculture Code, the proposal shall not be subject to further, further review. And again, the department shall provide electronic and or mail notification of the amendment and of, to the methodology and procedure to parties that have requested notification. And again, we will do that via our listserv. Um, so again, if this methodology and procedure is approved today and is approved by the secretary, we will send that out to all members of our listserv um, so that way they have it and it will be posted to our website. Um, so that is it. I noticed that there is, I think, in B2, yeah, Josh is pointing it out too. <laughs> it says, shall the, met, the amend, proposal to amend the methodology and procedure shall part of a regularly scheduled meeting. It should say, shall be part of a regularly scheduled meeting. Um, so there's one typo there, but otherwise, um, that's the proposal. So I'll open it up to the board if there's further discussion or comment or anyone wishes to make amendments to this um, proposed methodology and procedure, and then we'll open it up to the public as well. All right, one quick question, Josh. I remember when we were talking about approved seed cultivars, we had uh, the regular approved, and then we also talked about heirloom seeds. Are they included? So this is just the methodology and procedure to change the list. Um, so we've got at the very end of our agenda today a proposal to change the list, and so we can discuss the particular changes that are being proposed at the end of the agenda, assuming that everyone is okay with the methodology and procedure by which we do that. Um, so at this point, we'll focus on the procedure itself that we're following and whether or not that, that we need to make any amendments to that to make sure that we are you know, doing our due diligence to ensure um, public participation in the process. All right, thank you. I have a quick comment. Um, you have on the methodology here on the front page, you have uh, the word promptly as far as how long this would take before it can be placed on the list. Is there a 
time frame? What does promptly exactly mean? That's a good question. We took that straight from the law. <laughs> um, so that's the way that it's written in um, 81002. Um, And to file so item promptly. Five. So that's, um, I think that's actually, I'm not familiar with the process for what we do is we submit it as what they call a file and print. It goes from us to the Office of Administrative Law where they, again, they check to make sure all, all the, you know, all the T's are crossed and I's are dotted. Mm -hmm. um, but they submit it without any additional review to the Secretary of State. I'm not sure what that process looks like. Um, or how long it takes from getting from the Office of Administrative of Law to actually getting it posted on the, the web in the official um, list of regulations. It's on, I believe it's West Law. Um, yeah, I'm not sure how long that takes. Do we have an opportunity to put a time frame on it besides promptly? Or I think that's that already set in law. So I think that's set in the Administrative Procedures Act as far as what their timeline looks like. Okay. But I don't, I can't imagine it would take very long for it to go from you know, most of the stuff happens electronically these days, so it probably goes from us, Office of Administrative Law, and then straight over to the Secretary, back over this direction to the Secretary of State um, for them to file it and post it on the, you know, the, the official list of California regulations. Um, yeah, I'm not familiar with that process, but I can't imagine it takes that long. All right, does anyone else on the board have a question about the procedure to amend the list of uh, seen cultivars? Nope. Okay. Uh, is there anyone in the public uh, here today who would have any question or comment regarding uh, the procedure to amend the scene cultivars? Yes. Okay. Please come up uh, to the podium. State your name. G.V. Ayers with Gentle Rivers Consulting. Thank you. Uh, good morning uh, to you all. Uh, just a couple of couple of comments on this, and actually one question, which I'll ask before, and I don't know if, if y'all, uh, anyway. Uh, the, the procedure to add uh, or to amend the list of seed cultivars does not include, well, let me put it this way. Those in the list in 81002 on B1, 2, and 3 are already in the list, correct? So this would be adding to or taking some that may be deemed inappropriate that are on that list to be for California. So those are already on the list of seed cultivars that are, that, are, that are named in there. And then a second one is more of a procedural and really the, the, the uh, idea by which uh, we're going forward here with, this, with the list and the amendment of the list. All deference to the board, I think the board, I, Appreciate the work that you do. Would like it to go a little smoother and quicker and all that, as everybody would. But uh, m the way that I see this, uh, what we have posted is the department is giving way too much deference to the board in this. 81002 allows the department with consultation of the board, or the secretary with consultation from the board or the department. So. This makes everything go through the board. The law does not require everything to go through the board. It can go through the department. If there were a situation that happened where uh, the board would not be able to meet or the board would not be able to act, perhaps you can't get a quorum together for some, uh, for some reason, then uh, the department under these terms, which you have here, would not be able to act in amending or changing the list. Uh, I'd suggest to you that you may, the department may want that ability and uh, to actually protect your industrial hemp farmers in that. That's all. all right, that's a very good comment. Um, anyone on the board want to respond to that or have any comment? Uh, uh, we've been meeting, we've, you know, we've gotten to the point where we're meeting now like once a month. And I mean, personally, if you know we wanted to add more seeds onto it, I'd be absolutely in favor, you know, of adding it as quickly as possible. You know, so the only thing that would keep it from happening would be just, you know, whether we can actually meet once a month or whether it had to be every couple of months or three months. But with the growing season, I don't think that would be such a problem. But does anyone else want to comment on that?
think as it's written, I think people could come to the CDFA, propose their new varieties, or I think, um, I guess not everything's gonna have to be go through the CCIA, but I think things could be brought to the CDFA and then in a reasonable time period here, within I think 30 days, maybe slightly longer, I think things could get approved. Um, that's just my opinion. I think it's, I don't know if I'm missing something here. Well, this, the proposal would require that it comes from the board. So a request from the board or from four members of the board, the department shall schedule a hearing. So you know, keeping the hearings as part of a board meeting is fairly simple, although as GV mentioned, if we don't have a quorum, that could um, impact our ability to hold that meeting and hold that hearing. Um, however, you know, if there was a proposal to add an additional way for that to request, whether it's via the the chair of the board, members of the board, or I, I suppose the request could come from the department if the board wanted to also receive requests from the department as well. Um, but holding the via the board meetings was the, the idea behind that was it was an easy venue to do so, and we've um, certainly held enough meetings with a quorum in the last year that they do happen with some regularity. Um, but it would be up to the board on if they wanted to revisit and revise that um, and have another method in order for us to be able to hold a meeting. Yeah, also it says uh, upon the request of the chair of the board, which would be uh, me for right now, so I mean if anyone had an, uh, a new cultivar, it's just tell them to email me and then we can try to schedule it into the next meeting. Yeah. That, would that work? Yeah. Sure. I mean, and the other option is, and something we do want to keep in mind with both this item and the fall and the, you know, the, <laughs> assuming the, um, this procedure is approved as written, um, <laughs> then also with the list itself, um, the 30 day process here should be fairly simple to make an amendment. Um, so if we do need to, we did, that's why we included the ability to go back and amend this procedure as well, but also make that an open public process with board input. Um, so if that's something that we need to find that we need to go back and revisit within the next six months or a year or whatever, um, there is a procedure to be able to do that. So we could always come back and revisit it. All right. Any other uh, comments from the public on this issue or from the board? Oh, yep. One more. Let's step up. And if there was anyone else that would like to make a comment, if you wouldn't mind lining up, um, behind the podium or stepping up over against the wall here. We'd appreciate it so we know uh, what to expect. Thank you. Hi, uh, my name's Stephen King Jr. Uh, with uh, Farmers LLC. That's Farmers with a PH. I've been cultivating hemp for about four years now. Uh, I find that the, the whatever cultivars a state can use um, directly relates on how easy it is uh, for the farmer to maintain compliancy uh, and also maintain um, profitability. Um, if you limit the cultivars too much, uh, we can't be competitive with the rest of the nation. You have uh, states like West Virginia who's been growing now for um, four years. Maybe um, they might be on their fifth year now. Uh, and they started out with thresholds for their cultivars as high as, um, you know, 1% on, uh, on the total THC cannabinoids. And what that allows, it allows the farmer a lot of freedom. It allows, because, uh, I mean, our end goal is to have as little THC as possible. That's, that's what we strive for. But we're really held accountable for for what the variety does and there's so many factors that come in to where this like this 0 0.3 threshold at harvest is really hard to uh, maintain maybe on a homogenized biomass but but so I, I guess my point is is really really um, the uh, cultivars that we're allowed to use just directly relates to being competitive to the rest of the nation because we're too restrictive then we're just going to kill the farmers here and and then if we start uh, you know, really just punishing them for, for trying to be compliant, but, you know, you know, it's still a learning experience for everyone, then you, you the same thing. I mean, you put a farmer in crop failure because of a certain cultivar or something, and it's just going to, um, you know, everybody else is watching what we're doing right now. I mean, I have people talk to me every day. 
just trying to keep up with what we're, you know, we got going on. So, so that's, I just wanted to comment on that. So you just, people are aware that, that uh, the laws that you guys are making here, and I'm sure you are, uh, just directly relate to farmers in the field and uh, what we can do. All right. Hey, I, I, I really appreciate your comment. Uh, on, just, I'd say like a person to note, I totally agree with you. You know, we should have as many cultivars as possible and allow the farmer as much freedom. Right. And one. all these cultivars, and they come from different parts of the country, different latitudes, they all have to be adapted to here. And how they react is going to be totally different than the other end of the country. Or, you know, or, you know. Right. So. right. Well, thank you for your time. Right. Thank Appreciate you. It. Yeah, thanks for listening. Hi, my name is uh, Jeremy Keurig. Uh, I'm a hemp farmer from Oregon, and uh, I'm excited that you guys are putting all this energy in to make it work out in California. I know that uh, we have a big fish to fry. Uh, it's um, one thing I can tell you, though, from you know being in Oregon and growing uh, CBD and THC, uh, recreational and hemp, uh, is the testing standards. I don't know what how you guys are planning to roll this out in California, but. I've seen tests be totally. Oh, I know we're yeah. talking about cultivars. Yeah, yeah, we're we're going to be. I know. I'm just into saying. I know we're talking bit. about cultivars, but being a cultivar, you have to have good testing, and there's no standardization in Oregon, and it's the biggest problem that I've seen. I mean, we've taken the same thing to five different labs. Yeah, um, so that's actually on. I think on our agenda. It's on the agenda. Yes. Okay. Yeah, I'm sorry. You're, talking, you're okay. We'll and, get to okay, it. Okay. Well, you. back to the cultivar thing. So, is there a protocol on your website that explains how we can become a cultivar in, in California? Uh, we can discuss that when we discuss the list of approved seed cultivars at the, that's later on in the agenda. So we'll okay, be talking about the well. proposal to amend the list, and then we can talk okay. about what's being proposed. Okay, thank you. Yep. Sorry. No problem. Thank you. <laughs> All right. Do we have any other uh, comments from the audience or questions or comments from the board? Yeah, Lawrence. Uh, <clears throat> seeing what I'm hearing here, and I, I would be, uh, you know, from a farmer standpoint, too, concerned about we can't define how long anything takes. You see how long we're taking to get what we are here for done. You know, somebody that we just need to define, are we talking about six months, a month, you know, some kind of a time frame as far as getting a, a new variety or cultivar available. Right. To, well, I think for the procedure, Josh, you said it was a fairly quick thing if we approve it, right? Right. So, I mean, that's what's being proposed here today. So... The procedure here today is that it gets proposed. We post for 30, at least 30 days to make sure that there's an opportunity for public comment. Um, and then we hold a public meeting to further discuss it. So that's the procedure that's in place here. We're looking at, what, three or four months then? 30. 30 days. 30 days, okay. And then the board would make a recommendation. It would get forwarded to the secretary, and it would get forwarded over to the Office of Administrative Law for posting without any further review. Well, that so maybe another that couple happens. of weeks I, for that kind of thing. But yeah. That's okay. the benefit of this type of a process. All right. Oh. Just uh, to clarify, this process should be a lot faster than other processes we've had to go through. Yeah. Matt, do you have a comment? No, I was just seeing if we could make a motion to accept the, the language here. All right. Yeah, I, I have a, one more comment. Um, I know this is, it's kind of frustrating on how, what cultivars we could use and um, all, the, all that stuff, but I think this gives us a good pathway to amending a very specific list that we have right now that isn't good for any of the farmers or many of the farmers. And um, I think this is a good initial first step to amending this list and getting new cultivars into the, uh, onto the list. All right, any other comments from the board? All right, uh, Matt, you want to redo your motion? Sure, I'd like to make a motion to accept the proposed methodology and procedure to update the list of approved seed cultivars, uh, including the one typo we found in B2. Uh, all right, I will second that motion. All right, all in favor on the board? Uh, to accept Matt's motion, uh, please say aye. 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 All right, anybody opposed, say nay. 
And does anybody want to abstain? Nope, okay, the motion passes. All right, do we want to take a break now? Or do you want to chat if our, what, our uh, person is here? I think you want to chat in that person. All right, well, it uh, hasn't even been an hour yet. So. <laughs> all right, we'll keep going. Uh, all right, next uh, item on the agenda, and this is uh, an important item, is a dis discussion on the definition of disruption. Uh, basically, no, we're actually, I won't talk about Josh, take it. You're fine, and we'll get to the that uh, presentations for the next uh, agenda item, but. We'll get to it. Um, so very quickly, um, we did ask at the board's request to get a, an opinion on um, <clears throat> what it means to destroy in accordance with um, the Food and Agricultural Code in accordance with Section 81006, um, and also um, whether or not that will allow for any form of remediation. And so ver very quickly, so um, as written in both the current code as well as uh, the code as proposed in SB 1409, it states that a registrant that, shall, that grows industrial hemp shall destroy the industrial hemp grown upon a receipt of the test reports the test above. So it very clearly states that they, it says shall destroy, and destroy does not include remediation. Uh, it doesn't say shall destroy or remediate, doesn't allow for any form of harvest. Um, so that very clearly states that the industrial hemp grown shall be destroyed. Um, doesn't say part of the industrial hemp grown or anything like that. So there is no type of caveat that would allow for any form of remediation under current law at this point. Um, that's something that may want to be revisited by the legislature or the industry in the future, but currently it says destroy and destroy means destroy. We also don't have any way of, we also don't have any way of keeping track of the industrial hemp once it leaves the, the grower's hands as well. So that wouldn't allow for any form of like harvest and processing um, and retesting. So currently, just very clearly, it does say destroy, and destroy means destroy. Um, yeah, it does not allow for any form of remediation. I don't really have anything else to add on that, so uh, if there are any comments, that'd be fine, or if you would like to wait until um, Josh and the next agenda item, which is related, which would be regarding uh, methodology, methods of destruction, that'd be fine as well. All right, uh, anyone on the board have a question or comment about that? That's actually a, kind of an important one. Uh, I think when we were looking at it last time, uh, we looked up the meaning of destroy, right? And correct, and so, and the, the board is correct. So when the, um, the law does not further define any individual word, it falls to a dictionary definition. And so we did look at the dictionary definition of destroy and destruction, but it still requires Destruction. I mean, it does not allow for any form of harvest and remediation and sale of that product. It says destroy the industrial hemp grown, very clearly. How would the department uh, propose that destruction takes place? That's the next item. That's the next agenda item, and that's <laughs> we're seeking a recommendation from uh, the industry on the best methods for that destruction. Um, you know, experienced farmers who'd be able to to give us some advice on that. Thanks. I, I have a comment. So I, I wasn't able to ever speak to the legal team, but um, our argument that, you know, the number one line in the Webster definition was just to ruin the structure, which we thought could be interpreted as um, ruining the structure or uh, blending it, you know, with other material. But that appears to not be the case. So at this point in time, it appears that it needs to be a legislative amendment uh, to SB 1409 or you know the current law. So add it to the list of amendments, I guess. What's, what's the uh, dictionary definition we're going off of? Is it up here or? or? Um, I have it here. Uh, what, that wasn't what we had, present what we presented week. at the last uh, meeting was the Webster, or Merriam Webster Dictionary's definition to, of destroy. It means one, to ruin the structure, organic existence, or condition of, 
and then two, to put out of existence, B, neutralize, C, annihilate, vanquish. Okay, so we kind of interpret it as taking some of that stuff out of there as to neutralize or ruin the structure or organic existence, not necessarily tilling it into the soil, but um, you know, we propose that the final products would be tested and made sure that they were below 0.3%. Um, but that's current, our legal didn't agree with us on that. And just to be clear, it's not just the legal office, it's the department. <laughs> All right, uh, that's kind of discouraging because we certainly, it would be sad if somebody were to grow hemp and be, you know, a tiny bit over now, they completely destroy their crop and not use it for anything. Uh, but we will leave this. Uh, does anyone else on the board have a, a comment on that? I have uh, one more question. Is that, uh, I don't see the testing protocols. Is that for a homogenized sample or flowering top sample or? Um, Are you asking about testing protocols? Yeah. yeah. Um, we can discuss that when we get to the testing protocol item. Okay. Um, we'll have to make sure we have a copy of it. All right. Uh, so I have one more comment too. I think uh, Tom and I put together a pretty comprehensive list of uh, how how we could remediate or, you know, not destroy crops. And I think maybe there should be a push with the audience and members of the board to probably submit some amendments to 1409 and try to pass some legislation to fix this as soon as possible. But that's not something apparently that we can do here at the board. Yeah. No, and fortune or nine has already passed. Right. right. It's already been signed by the governor. Yeah. He means further legislation further, yeah. to further amend the current and pending law. All right. Uh, would anyone from the audience like to comment on that? Good morning, board members. Glad you're all here. Saw you last month. Wayne Richmond, California Hemp Foundation and California Hemp Association Executive Director. I brought this up last time. You have a letter about our stance on this crop destruction. I'm standing here going to tell you straight up, I am absolutely disappointed in my government. Right now, I am ashamed of my government to think that they can go ahead and shove some stupid idea that that hemp is fundamentally different and therefore we can't do something to help our farmers. We're going out of our way. The CDFA seems to be going out of their way to harm farmers. This whole nonsense of crop destruction in a state where I can walk down the street and buy a joint is absolutely stupid on its face. And if you folks don't think that we won't start a lawsuit to change that, I'm gonna tell you straight now, I've already talked to our counsel. That'll be the next thing that we as a group will do. We will sue the state and stop this nonsense. That's the end of my comment. All right, thank you, Wayne. Anyone else uh, want to make a comment? Yes. What was your name again, I'm sorry? Uh, it's it's uh, Stephen King, Jr. I go by Jr. <laughs> for obvious reasons, no relation. Um, but my, my business is farmers. That's farmers with a PH. Um, and this, this goes back to the cultivars. Um, as a farmer, you rely on the individual that you're purchasing seed from. Um, you rely on the stability of the genetics. Most of the time when you do these seed contracts, it's the, the only thing they guarantee is um, germination. So as a farmer, you're just left, well, okay, well, I hope this is what they say it is. So then you invest all your money and you, you hope that things are going to turn out. And then because of a minute threshold, you're just left with no options. You're put into crop failure. Uh, people can go bankrupt. And, you know, we start doing this and nobody's going to want to do it. You're already so far behind the rest of the nation. It's, it's very embarrassing. It really is. And, the, and uh, you know, pe people warned me that, that in California it was going to be this way. They were going to go through some huge growing pains. And I find that this is consistent with states that do uh, recreational or they do cannabis first and then hemp. There's all this confusion of this correlation, and it just doesn't really exist. I mean, you, you know, and, and people need to start looking at it in, 
in different ways. Uh, what they're trying to regulate isn't really a plant. They're trying to regulate one cannabinoid, this set of THC cannabinoids. Where's another? There's hundreds more there that they're, you know, that they're open for us to cultivate. And we shouldn't be punished because of genetic inconsistencies with plant where an individual can walk out into a field when you're growing with seed and they pick off one piece of one plant and then that throws you into the, has the possibility of putting you into crop failure because of some random test, which you can't prove the reliability of the labs that are testing it. Like, he, like the gentleman said before, send it off to five different labs, you get five different results. So you send it off to one lab and one set of one technicians says, okay, you're in crop failure because you're in uh, 1.2 when you might have labs that say 0.5. And when the paperwork they put out with these labs say that we have inaccuracies up to one full, full percent. So how can there be any consistency or third party verification in order to take these kind of actions against a farmer? So who, it costs money for us to have THC in there. So we don't want it, we want zero. If we can have it, zero all day long. But we gotta get it first, and how do we get it? Through trial and error. But if you start just crushing the first people out of the gate, saying, oh, you, you're 1.2, so welcome to the, you know. <laughs> to, yeah, right, exactly, because nobody's gonna do it. You're gonna wind up with this, this program that is self-defeative, and you're already behind. The leading agricultural in the U.S. is so far behind, it's ridiculous. I mean, like I said, West Virginia figured this stuff out over four years ago. And we're dinking around with, you know, the, the yeah. It's um, incredibly frustrating as a farmer. And I've already talked to people who are vacating and leaving, going to Oregon because of what's happened. They're like, okay, nope, too much, too much stuff. Let's go to Oregon. Let's lease land there. And that's what you're going to have. That's the year you're going to have coming up. So um, unless people take a stand and say, look, okay, we understand. You know, it, 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 the, the crime lies in the motivation. What's the motivation? There's no motivation for me to, to break these thresholds. I'm not, you know, it, I, like I, I said, it costs. got about 30 seconds. Yeah. yeah. Sorry. 30 seconds. No, no, no. Uh, if anybody has any questions for me, feel free to. You know, contact me. I'll talk about this stuff all day long. So um, I just want to see it a success, you know, just like everybody else. But um, it's they're making it very hard. So, all right. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you, Junior. GV Ayers with General Rivers Consulting. Just a, a question. Is the um, legal opinion by Department Counsel, is that available? to be shared? No, again, that was that's the opinion of the department, and so that's what I stated here today. Okay, okay. So even though that you've stated it in a public venue, so the it will be in the minutes. cannot be, pardon? It will be in the minutes. Okay. Um, if you want more details than that, we would have to prepare something. Okay, okay, thank you. Yeah. I just uh, was, was curious about that. Uh, as far as it, as far as it goes, yes, destruction is what it is, is stated in the law. Interpretation of that is obviously what we're uh, what the department's dealing with here uh, in in this. Obviously, it seems from my untrained opinion, I'm not a farmer by any means, so that caveat being out there. But my untrained opinion would be that there needs to be, or there will be people who will who may need to do some testing with individual individual seeds to see how they perform and how they will be before they invest large amounts of money into something that they put in the ground on a large scale crop there. So they want they would probably want to be reassured themselves that seed will perform here in according to the specs, uh, specifications of the law in that. So and obviously that's how the magic that the farmers do, that's to be worked out. Anyway, thank you. Hey, Josh, did I just hear you say that the department, the C Department of Food and Ag is the one that made the, de the ruling on this uh, yes. definition or whatever? Not legal. It's, it's the, the opinion of the department. Yes. George Bianchini, SG Farms. 
uh, two points on the destruction. Um, almost every uh, point that was brought up under the terms of destruction kind of sounds like extraction to me. Um, uh, so uh, if, if plants do go hot, it seems to me of the elimination of the THC through a destruction process of the plant, which is extraction, could separate the illegal component and then the board just needs to figure out what's done with that. Destroy the illegal component. Do not destroy the legal component. Then the other side of this is probably getting into testing, is marijuana is tested for the flower. Only the flower is sold. Hemp, the entire plant is sold. The entire plant should be tested. One entire plant should be harvested or, and then ground up and then tested, not just the flower. Otherwise, it's a trap. All right, we're going to be getting into that. That's on the schedule a little bit later. Thank you. All right. I, I agree with you. All right, anyone else in the audience uh, want to uh, uh, comment on this? All right, do we want to make any motions uh, regarding this agenda item? Are we on point four or have we moved to point five? We're still on four. Okay. Yeah, uh, I, I might want to point out that the, the word destroy comes from the original Proposition 64 uh, the, in the, the part on industrial hemp. So it wasn't anything that the Department of Agriculture put together or this board put together. So we're kind of having to deal with the hand we've been dealt. Uh, I would recommend that you know, uh, we do try to make more changes to the law so we don't have to have farmers uh, end up having to destroy the whole, whole crop and ruin their years work with this. But that's a whole other issue. That's not something we do here. All righty, uh, why don't we move on uh, to number five, uh, the discussion following uh, the discussion on crop destruction, responsibilities and procedures. Actually, why don't we have a break before we do that? Yeah, we've been here an hour, so why don't we take a 10 minute break before we go on to item number five. All right, we'll come back. We'll start back at uh, 1040.
All right, everyone, uh, take your places and back to your chairs. We're going to have to uh, get moving. All right, so wait for all the board members to come back. All right, everyone uh, take your places. Uh, what we'll do, I'm gonna change up the order a little bit. We're gonna jump to uh, item number seven, uh, which is the discussion of the definition of tetrahydrocannabinol. And uh, we'll do that because it'll, it'll flow a little bit better uh, when we talk about definitions, test, uh, testing, and then possible destruction. So, uh, the question uh, that we had last month was, uh, when we talk about THC, are we talking about delta 9 THC, or are we also talking about THCA, which is the acidic version of it? So uh, I volunteered to uh, write a, a little paper on this, and the question is, THCA and THC, uh, what is the difference? And basically, uh, THCA is the acidic form of THC, and THCA actually will convert into THC. Uh, THCA uh, is non-intoxicating non when consumed in the raw cannabis, uh, fresh or uncured and unheated, but once it does uh, become THC, it does become uh, intoxicating. Uh, Basically, uh, what happens, uh, you can read to it, I'm not going to uh, sit and read, but basically, if uh, THCA is heated, it becomes decarboxylated, and it removes the carboxylic acid group from the cannabinoid, and change and enhances its ability to interact with the body. Without decarboxylization, THCA has very little affinity from the cannabinoid receptor since it can't fit. Uh, the CB1 activation is a requirement for intoxication. If molecules that don't fit here, they can't get you high. Basically, you can convert it. Uh, heat will remove the carboxylic acid group from THCA, and it will carboxylate it into THC. 
uh, and then, of course, the THC will fit into the, the CB1 uh, receptor throughout the human body, uh, producing uh, intoxication. If you scroll down a little bit, you can actually see uh, the molecular formula there converting THCA to THC. Bottom line, THCA uh, can convert to THC. THCA is not intoxicating, but THC is. Ways to convert it would be heat, light, or other ways. Uh, sunlight can convert it. Uh, a higher room temperature can convert it as well. So the question uh, came up is when, we, when labs are testing for THC, are they testing for THCA or delta 9 THC? Uh, what we found out is it depends really on the test. Uh, some labs will test it for both and uh, show the results, uh, the part of the cannabis that's a THCA as well as a THC. And uh, it really will depend on the type of test used. For example, if a laboratory uses high-performance liquid chromatography, or HPLC, the THCA is not carboxylated and both the THCA and the THC will show up in the test. But if a laboratory uses gas chromography, the THCA will be carboxylated, and therefore it will not show up in the test result as uh, THCA. Results will only be given as a THC. It should be noted that with gas chromography, not all the THC will convert to, uh, THCA will convert to THC, so the THC reading may be lower. So uh, how does this look in the current legislation? If we look uh, in uh, federal legislation, uh, when they're defining uh, marijuana, they're basically defining industrial hemp, meaning cannabis sativa L in any part that has a below 0.3% of delta-9 THC. So the definition is only under THC, not THCA. And uh, the new 2018 Farm Bill, which is yet to pass, uh, but we're thinking possibly by the end of the year, specifically states that the procedure for testing use, uh, uses post decarboxylation or other similar reliable methods. Delta 9 tetrahydrocannabinol concentration levels of hemp produced in the state or the territory. So basically, in the 2018 Farm Bill, they're claiming that the test method. Uh, does need to be carboxylate, or you need to use a carboxylated THC is what you're testing for. Uh, in comparison, we have different states. Uh, practically all the states follow the federal uh, definition of industrial hemp, and they all define it as uh, lower than 0.3% delta 9 THC. But different states do have different testing methods. Uh, states that use gas chromography are Colorado, Kentucky, and Indiana, where uh, Minnesota uses high-performance liquid chromography. Uh, Oregon does not specify the test method, but they do specify the THC calculation include THCA, and labs need to keep their samples below 70 degrees to avoid decarboxylation. Now, I'm not a, a technician, so uh, we've invited uh, a person here today to talk a little bit about the lab testing. Michelle? Uh, Donald Land from Steep Hill, uh, can you join us? And then uh, let's start off with a, a brief introduction. Uh, either one. Hi, uh, Don Land. I'm a professor of chemistry at UC Davis and a chief scientific consultant for Steep Hill Labs, which is a chain of cannabis testing labs across the world, I guess. Uh, would you like me to just launch in? Yeah, go ahead. Sure. Yeah, so, so um, the law enforcement and uh, UN methods of testing use the gas chromatography, which converts the THCA. It's got a hot inlet, so it converts the THCA into THC immediately. Uh, that is, has been the prescribed method to test for THC f since the 70s, um, and still in operation in most crime labs. I'm also a professor of forensic science at UC Davis, so I'm in that graduate program as well. So I'm, I've got students kind of all over, DEA, ATF, FBI, 
Cal DOJ, whatever, right? I've got students in, in crime labs all over the, the state and country. Um, and they use GC to test for THC, if they still do that, uh, in the states where they do that. Um, and I would suggest that's the method you adopt. And the reason is basically just what you explained. So if you heat THCA, it converts to THC, it's not 100% efficient. All the THC is, uh, excuse me, all the THCA, the acid form, is removed. Not all of it converts to THC. So the rules that got put in place about 0.7 or 0.3 were developed based on the GC testing. And that's easier to pass. And the reason it's easier to pass is because of that inefficiency. The states, the states, did I just wreck that? The states mandate, the, the states that mandate testing uh, for, or, or reporting of a total THC number for the medicinal or recreational cannabis, they typically will uh, say that you take the THCA number, you multiply, you multiply it by the weight loss, which gives you a factor of 0 0.88, and that is what you calculate as the potential THC from the THCA. You take that potential THC from the THCA, add it to the THC that's already there. Because the actual, uh, the actual process isn't 100% efficient, the real, in a, in a GC, that number, instead of 0.88, is about 0.75. And so for the same amount of THCA and THC in the sample, what has gone through in the past when these rules, about 0.3%, 0.2%, whatever, in the UN and so on, those rules were based on that lower conversion rate. And so if you choose to use HPLC and do this 0.877 number, or 8.88 8, 8 number, you will end up already having about 10 to 15% higher values for the same uh, plant composition. Does that make sense? All right, I, I had a few questions, and I think a lot of people had questions about testing. There's a lot of fears that uh, some labs might test it one way, other labs might test it another. And so one of my questions is, how accurate is your gas chromography? Uh, I noticed you mentioned uh, a, tenth, uh, a tenth of a percent, and you even mentioned a hundredth of a percent. So how accurate are they really? Um, well, I, they're about 5% relative done right, right, so using an internal standard. So, so in other words, uh, if the number is 0.3, I've got to do that math, uh, if it's 0.3, we should get between uh, 0.285 and 0.315. There is some margin of error. Uh, if you want to talk about margins of error, I can launch into the ISO 217 rules, <laughs> no, requires, right, but, it but basically it requires that. It's 5% of the value you're getting. It's right. not you're adding 5% to it. Right, and yeah. it, if you, so we have a lab in Arkansas, for example, that is gearing up to test hemp in Arkansas. Uh, and what you, basically from the science standpoint, you want to have a calibration just for that because typically we're not measuring THC and THCA at such low levels in the rest of the stuff that we do. So to get that number as accurate as possible, you want to calibrate in that range. And that's easy to do, it's just that's what has to be done. And uh, another question, people were concerned about contamination, being that if one of your labs is uh, testing uh, the marijuana strings for recreational marijuana, and then somebody brings in an industrial hemp variety, what, how do you guarantee that there isn't any contamination in your instruments? Yeah, so that, that is, uh, you know, a real concern that is true of pesticides and everything else. If I got a contaminated sample or to calibrate the machine, I gotta put a bunch of those analytes in there. How do I make sure that they're gone? So we have both engineering and procedural controls to make sure that there's no carryover, as it's called. And uh, those controls include running blanks periodically to make sure that there's nothing carrying over. Um, but we do 
parts per billion, parts per trillion pesticides that don't carry over either. It, it, that would be a problem. And then what, what was your accuracy? Is it to a, a tenth of a percent or a hundredth of a percent or even uh, a thousandth of a percent? This, this, for the cannabis testing, the, the recreational and medicinal cannabis testing, the, the, um, the rules say that we have to be able to be accurate to 0 0.01. 0 0.01 percent. All right, let's see. So point. No, that's not testing. That's what you have to produce. If you're producing a, a product, you have to be plus or minus 10%. 0.01. Uh, so let me think. So 0.01 milligrams. So yeah. So, yeah, I think that's 0.01%. I got to think about whether those units are in percent. All right. And when you do testing, do you also do multiple tests of one sample and try to get uh, an average, or is it just one test? Well, that so in the state rules it's mandated that we do one test and that's all anybody's willing to pay for is one test right so two tests generally cost about twice as much not quite but um, i would definitely prefer if the mandated number were at least two with two at least you could see what the range is so we're talking about a heterogeneous sample no matter what you've done to homogenize it as a lab we try to homogenize it when it comes in the door but there's no way to take a, a plant sample like that that's heterogeneous in great magnitude and convert it into something that is exactly homogeneous right you do the best you can by grinding it up and sifting and all this kind of stuff but the the best thing to do is have ultimately three tests but two is what I would say would be the bare minimum. And certainly when we do, when we get a, at Steep Hill, our policy is anything that fails on a, on a limit test, whether it be pesticides, mycotoxins, whatever, we retest it so that by at our cost at this point. But we'd rather not do it at our cost. <laughs> All right, thank you, Don. Uh, do we have any, uh, uh, well, before we go to the audience. Yeah, in a moment, we, we first, first have to ask the board member. Uh, do we have any other questions from I have a, the board? I have a question. I have a question. Um, first, you mentioned, I thought it was accuracy of 5%, and then the, then you said the 0 0.01. So, yeah, so, um, um, so 0 0.01, um, I'm trying to remember now, it's in the regs as a, uh, percent I believe 0 0.01 percent is what we're required so uh, okay there's so there's a percent in the sample and then there's the percent relative to your value so what I said was five percent relative to the value we get okay it's a little conservative we do a little better than that usually we don't usually do it by GC but that's what I would recommend uh, our GC numbers for other things are, are around that within about five percent for non-volatile things like THC and THCA um, and uh, what, I, what it, that really is, is uh, the limit of detection is 0 0.01, and I think that's percent by weight. So that's a, really a limit of detection, and so we have to be able to c calibrate down to that point. But any measurement that we get, so if we, if we get a measurement of 0 0.01, which is kind of at the bottom, um, we should still have... 10 to 1 signal of noise there because that's what we have to have an LOQ there. So that's a 10 to 1 signal of noise, which means we should still be able to hit plus or minus 5% of that 0.01. In other words, we would, if it's really 0.01, we would measure 0.0095 to 0.015. Oops, yeah. 0.0105. It's a little low. Uh, so, like I said, I would. In Arkansas, what we're going to do, and what if we end up doing this in California, what I would do is I'd have a separate calibration curve for that specific test, and it would be on a GC, and we don't measure any others on GC, so it would be a standalone test that we calibrated just for this, and we can, we can get that number down as low as you want to, but ideally you, you're aiming at that 0.3%. That should be in your sweet, sweet spot of your analytical calibration curve, and that's easy to do. So within 5% of that 0.03, or 0.3%, rather, is, is easy-ish. All right, uh, another kind of uh, 
question, not really for you, but for Josh, uh, in the new SB 1409, uh, it says uh, CDFA approved laboratories. I imagine Steve Hill, we invited him here today, he could qualify. Do you have any insight into that on, on how, how you may be uh, uh, approving a lab? So we've already had discussion with the board on that. I believe, if I'm recalling correctly, the board's recommendation for an approved laboratory would be any ISO um, accredited laboratory. And so if that's the case, I would assume that would include Steep Hill since every um, cannabis laboratory is also required to be ISO accredited. Um, and so that would leave that open. But that's something that we would want to, and we'll go back and check the minutes, obviously, but that's something we would want to confirm with the board before um, putting that into a regulation as far as what our approved laboratory is. All right, anyone else on the board? Yeah, I have a question. Um, so if we can scroll up on this presentation to where the sampling, okay, so we have a sample here that tests at 0.31% uh, total THC. Given the um, margin of error that you're discussing, potentially that could have been a sample that was under 0.3% and then had that 5% error to make it over 0.3? Yeah, so the THC there is 0.25%, I believe. Uh, it's in the, the, the right. uh, table on the right, so it's uh -huh. 0.25%. And so that, that number, the 0.31%, is, I believe, calculated by taking that 0.25, multiplying by 0.877 or 0.88, and then adding the THC to it. Oh, adding the THC. And then, right. So the okay. total THC is the THC that's already there plus the THC that comes from the THCA. So you measure the... Okay. In, in liquid chromatography, they're measured separately. They don't convert. Got it. Gas chromatography is the way to go. Got it. Thanks. All right. Anyone else have a, uh, on the board have a question uh, for our guests? All right, we'll open it up to the uh, members of the audience. Would you like to ask Don uh, from St. Hugh Hill a question? Come on, come on up to the... That's my labs up there. How'd that get up there? <laughs> That's my variety. Up there. I, I ran those labs. I was just curious about that. <laughs> uh, yeah, that's my variety of hemp there. Don? Those are labs I ran and... and Sitting right over yeah. here. Uh, so uh, one, one question was is that how do you uh, homogenize the samples? Like, okay, well, you're, you're going out to the field, you're picking up and you're, you're collecting samples. I know in Oregon, so let's say you got a five acre plot. Well, we go down one side and per acre, you're taking about, oh, about 30 samples, about eight tops, 22 side branches, eight inches long. So you, by the time you test, uh, you know, a larger hemp field, you got, you got bags of samples. You, so you're saying all these, all these bags of samples, all grown from seed, with a little bit different genetic variation, you're going to be able to homogenize all that and get an accurate representation of that crop that a farmer can bet his whole livelihood on. Uh, no, that's not how I would do it. Uh, if the, so, in in the state required testing of recreational and medicinal cannabis, that's the, you can have a batch up to 50 pounds. So that's the maximum batch size. And then from that 50 pounds, we have an employee who's trained in random sampling go see that entire batch of 50 pounds and do a random sampling from that batch of 50 pounds. And we take about 50 grams, and that 50 grams we bring back to the lab and gets chopped up and ground up. Wait, you're going to do batch samples on hemp? I'm not proposing that. These folks are making the decisions right. about yeah, that. I'm telling you what we do. Done on him. You don't have a program. Right. Well, we're, we, we test that. I mean, I, I got. All right. Well, we're, we're not there yet. We're, okay. Uh, that's, but, that's not on the item is how we're going to do the sample. Okay. Well, I'm saying this is stuff gets very complex when a farmer has to bet. Like, like right now we're like, we're almost like $900,000 into the red and like, when you have farmers kind of betting that their whole entire livelihood, my entire livelihood on these samples, they have to have an accurate representation. Yeah, well, it, like I said, that's our next sure. on the agenda yeah. item. We're just talking about the actual testing, but next step will be sure. how we do the sampling. And my last quick comment is I just wanted a scientific question for him. Is it's you see Stephen, up here, before you continue, 
If you wouldn't mind using the microphone just oh, so everybody can hear sorry. you. Sorry, yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Um, so when you have, uh, let's see, you have THCA. THCA decarboxylates into delta-9 THC, which is the psychotropic element in cannabis, the one, the one main element that can get you high. Nothing else really gets you high. Okay. So what happens when you heat delta-9 further? When it's past this decarboxylation temperature? Yeah, you have to heat it quite a bit hotter. So you've got to heat it to probably almost you know, 180, 200 C. If you were to heat it hotter, uh, it would decompose into other things. Yeah. yeah. C CBM primarily. CBN, yeah. Delta 8, THC, there's yeah. several. But other once you heat it a little further, then it can't get you high anymore. Right. No, much. Delta 8 THC is about as psychoactive as Delta 9. That's one of yeah. the heating products that well, forms and then could go away. But, from you know. my own experience, if you decarboxylate it further, you know, the, then the majority of the Delta 9 THC converts to CBN, which is not psychotropic. Mm, it really depends on the temperatures and the right. times. But you can do it. You can, you can destroy anything with heat, enough right, heat. Right. Absolutely. What I'm saying is I, you, you don't can, have an argument for me on you that. You can take a gallon of extract, and, and it can have the you would also in there, yeah. and mm -hmm. you can heat it far enough to where that you can still maintain all the other cannabinoids or the no. majority of them. No, they all decompose about the same temperature. So if you're going to heat it enough to decompose THC, the CBD will also decompose significantly, and anything else, all the terpenes and cannabinoids in there will also decompose. They have okay. very similar I, I, chemistries and stability. I, I got a lot of labs that kind of say otherwise, but, you know. Well, okay, you I was just curious what your opinion was on that. Okay. Thank you for your time. I appreciate it. Anybody got any questions from me? Or? Okay. <laughs> Good luck. <laughs> George Bianchini. Uh, a couple of points. Um, personally, I like using Steep Hill Lab. Um, their, nor their numbers consistently come in low. So I use them on hemp, but I don't use them on, on uh, marijuana because I'm on both sides of that. So, for instance, the yep. last hemp test we did. Right. We're, we're accurate. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Whether, whether the client yeah. wants high numbers yeah. or not, we give the right numbers. And, and, uh, and not all of yeah. our competitors And that's, and that's that. the yeah. exact one we get. But, we, uh -huh. you know, one will be eight. The next one's 10. Harems will come in at 12. CB Lab comes in at 14. They go all over the board. And they all say we're better than the other ones. Uh, but and that's all fine. Uh, but the reality is they're all across the board. Um, uh, so and then the other point here, we're talking about physically changing a cannabinoid. Well, I see no um, uh, language in Prop 64 or even the 2014 hemp bill. There is something in 2018 of of changing a cannabinoid. So if we're going to open the door to say that we can change and modify a cannabinoid, I can take and make virtually every molecule of CBD into THC. So if we're going to allow what the plant in nature produces to let man change, then we can't just stop it from one procedure. Okay. So for instance, Nevada. Nevada is not on your list up there. The only test they do is Delta 9 THC, not THCA. They won't even tell you how much CBD you got. So my point is the law says THC. THCA is a separate cannabinoid. They all start from CBG, A, acidic, and you can get your THC, CBD, and any number of different things as the plant matures and grows and, and changes. And it should be left up to the farmer to harvest that crop the way they see fit and then they either pass or fail. But if you're going to count THCA, oh, how about THCV? How about CBDV? Um, and all the other cannabinoids, I believe we're opening up a can of worms. So, um, and if you do uh, limit it to, to TH, to Delta 9 THC, um, we can't do these other tests. So the gas chromatography is never used for hemp because it physically and mechanically changes. You're basically taking off a molecule of CO2, which is carbon. Um, I may not be, be explaining that in the exact scientific uh, method, uh, but it is modifying that from what it is. And Prop 64, especially being on the writing side of that initiative at one point, specifically put the language in there that only the only qualifying factor is THC. 
no other cannabinoid, none of the other 125 known cannabinoids, one THC. They're all the other cannabinoids are separate. Their molecules look different. So that's about all I got to say. Thank you. Paul Pereira. Um, uh, concerning the, the testing, can and how does sample preparation uh, affect results uh, from one lab to another? And if so, should this board be looking at setting up uh, standardized protocols that, uh, as they're approving labs, that the sample preparations be done in a, in a, a like manner from lab to lab? I would say yes, that setting up standard protocols that all labs have to follow would be ideal, and that doesn't exist in the other cannabis world, and that's part of the reason for the variation, but the biggest part of the variation in the other part of that world is that you, your clients like it a lot more when your values of high, are high. We go around and test, we, we pull samples off of shelves and compare our results to other labs. We're always the lowest value. That's not statistical, that's bias. So. Yeah, I would just I mean I would just suggest that you look at standardizing protocol for sample collection and for sample preparations. And just to be clear, so if there's any other comments on it, sample um, sampling procedures are on the agenda, and I think we're going to that next. All right. Anyone else in the audience have a question for uh, Don with Deep Hill Labs? Okay. Anyone else on the board have a question for Don with Deep Hill Labs? Okay, let's go on. Uh, there's no motions or anything on that one. That was just uh, more uh, enlightening, informative. All right, now we're going to go on to uh, item number six, which is discussion on sampling responsibilities and procedures. And uh, I guess we're going to take it. Uh, Richard, you're going to handle that, correct? Yes. Well, at the, at the last meeting, um, Alice and I came up with option one and option two. Well, those didn't fly, so we came up with option three. <clears throat> but before we did option three, <clears throat> I was in Oregon. I visited a couple labs up there. <clears throat> they have a total different protocol. <clears throat> the labs up there, they're the ones that take the samples. Um, Allison's from South Carolina, and so she contacted the labs there. Well, the, uh, they're the labs to take the samples. So each state has their own rules, but since um, cannabis and hemp are both ag or cultural crops, everything falls under the Ag Commissioner here in California. So I went to the, my local Ag Commissioner office in Watsonville on October 15th, and then on the 18th, I went to the Monterey Ag Commissioner's office, and each office has somebody in their office that takes care of hemp. So I talked to Pamela in the Watsonville office that takes care of hemp, and she is the Deputy Agriculture Commissioner and I talked to Robert Roach in Monterey County, and he's the Assistant Agricultural Commissioner. And I showed him option three. Both of them liked option three. They liked, if you look at option three, um, sampling must be performed by the County Ag Commissioner. The Ag Commissioner has the option of designating an ISO certified lab to collect the samples. Both of them like that option out, even though both of them probably said <clears throat> they let the Ag Commissioner go out and take the samples. And we were discussing before pricing. Well, the Ag Commissioner in the Wattsville office charges $65 an hour. I have a list here of all the charges that the Ag Commissioner culture commissioner charges if anybody 
wants to see it, we could pass it around. I highlighted the two things that are pertinent to him. It's actually $71.45 they charge an hour. If they have to go out for overtime, it's $107.18 an hour. So if anybody has any questions, I'll be glad to answer them. Uh, some comments. Um, so it looks like we we had the debate last time of um, you know is it the county ag commissioner or is it going to be a certified person from the laboratory to take it? And I talked to my agricultural commissioner, and he, for destructive purposes, he thought it would be better if they did it. Um, that aside, it looks like we've added another option in here of them designating the ISO certified lab. I believe in the last um, meeting it was, that was going to be uh, designated by the um, farmer. Is that right? Or Yes, that's, okay. that's right. It should still be the farmer. I guess I ordered it wrong. It's the farmer's choice what lab he'd like to go to, not the Ag Commissioner's. All right, uh, just uh, uh, a note here. Uh, the idea here is who, who's uh, going out to do the testing? Is it going to be a private company or is it going to be uh, somebody from uh, the county going out there? And if it's a private company, it's a lot, lot easier in that there's going to be enough labs available to help that. If we throw it on uh, the agriculture, the Department of Agriculture, it, we may end up with a situation where they do not have enough people at the time of harvest uh, to get it out there. So that's one of the, one of the things that we were discussing at that time. Also, uh, the county uh, agricultural commissioner may have to charge a lot more money uh, to do it if they have to have a lot of people running around they may not even have enough people available at the time to do it so that was one of the thing that was one of the reasons why we were leaning more towards uh, a private lab to actually do the collection uh, with the farmer true but if we just designate the labs like some other states do I don't think it's going to fly with the Ag Commissioner and with the chain of custody, it has to go through the Ag Commissioner. So, uh, go ahead. Go ahead. So what is the proper wording up here then on this? Well, sampling must be performed by the Ag Commissioner. The County Ag Commissioner has the option of doing the testing or letting a certified lab do the testing. The word designating should be taken out. But where is the farmer's choice in this? That was discussed previously that the farmer had the choice. And that's still in there? Should, be, should still be in there. Okay, so we'll have to reword that to reflect that. Right. Okay. Mm -hmm. So Rick's not here, but I will point out one of the things that he commented on at the last meeting, which is his concerns about having someone other than a regulatory official collecting the sample or at the very least overseeing collection of that sample and ensuring that the chain of custody is maintained to the lab because they would be responsible for taking any action based on that sample. Um, generally speaking with all the other programs, as I mentioned in the past, we don't take action on a non-regulatory sample. It was not something that's not generally done by the department. If we have, for instance, a disease positive that's reported by a private laboratory, we have a regulatory official go back out, collect that sample, and actually get a, a positive test done at a regulatory lab. Um, so they did have, Rick did have concerns about the, with the way the, the law is written requiring destruction uh, within a certain time frame, the Ag commissioner having to enforce that provision without a regulatory official collecting that sample. All right, do we have some more uh, questions or comments on that? This is probably, probably one of the more difficult things we have to decide. 
So just to double check, because I did miss a meeting, a couple meetings prior to this, mm -hmm. if, mm -hmm. if the sample turns up positive, is there a resampling? Or is it just the one sample that triggers the destruction? The law provides for an, an automatic resample if the te initial test result is between 0.3% and 1% THC, and it does not provide for a resample if the test result is above 1% THC. Okay. Um, and then depending on either the initial sample, if it's above 1%, or the resample if it's between 0.3 and 1%, then that triggers a, a destruction clause in 81006. So should we include all that here in option three also? Right now the question at hand. Like a, a single sample, even though the law states differently. I understand Correct. that. Correct. So I mean, if the board would like to also discuss resampling procedures and if those would be different from the initial sample, I think that's fine. Um, but you know, we do need to, the department, the department it, with um, SB 1409 coming into effect will be required to establish sampling procedures. Um, and so we would want to include any resampling procedures if those were different, certainly. Is the text of 1409 available? Can we pull it up or is it in the in the folder? We didn't hand it out, but um, you can look it up online or if you want to look it up during your lunch break and um, we can try to provide copies to the board members as well, but it is okay. available online. So the we also have to determine how the sample is actually taken, right? as part of that, because it's no longer listed in the uh, language of 1409 that was passed. It was Correct. up to the board and, or the department. Right, and we previously had recommended um, guidelines for that from Richard, Richard Nelson at previous meetings. Right, so that's not what we're considering right now, or it's? I think that's part of what's being considered, but I think the question at hand, which the board has gone through multiple times now is, who needs to collect that sample in order to make sure that it's an official sample and can, you know, again, very severe regulatory actions being taken on that, um, you know, ensuring that that process is being done correctly. Um, but yeah, I mean, if the board would like to revisit the actual sampling procedures themselves, I don't think they're listed on this slide. But they have been presented. Right, so right now we're just kind of saying who's going to take the sample of it. Yeah, that, that's the question. Who's going to take the sample? All right. Uh, why don't we hear from the uh, hear from the public? Unless somebody else on the board has another question about this. Yeah, I'd like to. I mean, it just doesn't seem like. Are, are we only discussing the like chain of custody here? Because it doesn't seem like this is a full like presentation of the sampling protocol. Right. And then has the sampling protocol already been decided upon? Has it been? We've yeah, we had motion. a board motion on that previously. This okay. was when, with that board motion, these issues were not addressed. And okay. so we're, you know, looking for some clarity on that. Um, obviously, once everything's been, we have a full recommendation from the board, we'll come back with the full procedures for the board to, to review. Okay. Sounds good. I, I have another comment. Um, in the law, it doesn't specifically say who is overseeing the destruction. So that's up to, you know, our opinion of who does that. I'm kind of curious what Rick thinks. It's probably going to fall upon the sheriff or law enforcement if they think something's not happening correctly. Yeah, our, our concern is just that it gets destroyed, um, you know, how that, how that occurs. Yeah. You know, I'm sure there's many ways that it can occur, and it might be a local issue you know, on how it gets destroyed, but... Our concern is those high THC content grows is really is really where the concern would be. Um, so, yeah, I had I have one more comment too. Um, I was talking to the labs as well, or talking to some labs, and currently with the um, medical or uh, adult use cannabis, the um, labs are taking those samples for pesticide residues and all that, and. Um, I'm not, you know, the destruction, I think, is overseen by law enforcement or there's no oversight by the Ag Commissioner or um, Correct. anyone else. Yeah. Correct. Uh, it falls upon us to take care of the, you know, sometimes we'll destroy at the, and then we can build back the, you know, whoever the grower was of it. 
it just depends, you know, on the situation and how many plants, et cetera. Yeah, uh, and the structure is actually our next agenda item, how we do that. So right now, I think the, the questioning where we, we have right now in front of us is really chain, chain of... Um, chain of custody. Chain of custody, yeah, exactly. Uh, why don't we hear uh, from uh, the audience? Uh, they have some comments on that chain of custody. Uh, so, it, it, have you guys determined sampling size, like in relation to five acres versus 500 acres? Also, uh, when you're doing this initial collection, you're doing it 30 days before harvest, your cannabinoid profile is going to be way different than, or not way different, but, it, but if your point is, is to like, okay, we're going to check THC threshold, and we're going to take 30 pounds of samples from this big field. we got 100 acres out there. We're doing the X pattern across it, but you're going to have a pile of samples. So to take one sample out of there and say that that's an accurate representation of that big, huge field is, is not accurate. That whole, everything has to be homogenized. You can't simply go in there and take one tip of a bud off of one plant and expect that to be an accurate representation of that field. So all that material... Um, you know, we're harvesting whole plant for extraction. We're bailing it up. And so, so that, that's what we're leaving. You know, that's what, um, you know, uh, uh, that's our crop. That's how we're selling it. So at the very least, it should be a test on what, you know, we're selling as a farmer, not just this one particular tiny piece. It, it just seems like the whole thing is orchestrated to punish the farmer. Okay. So, um, <laughs> You know, and, 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 you know, when you're talking about destruction, you've gotten all wrapped up in this thing of destruction because of cannabis crops, illegal cannabis crops. Like I said, our bottom line as farmers is low as THC as possible. But we can't, you know, sometimes things happen. Genetics, you know, um, watering, stress, stress causes, you know, the THC to go up. There can be all kinds of factors, you know. So in this day and time, when we can take 20,000 pounds and process it in one day and the machine spits out CBD in one container and THC in another, why are we, is, is destruction even on the table? Why I just, I, I, I don't understand it. So it, it, if the law is designed and this whole thing is protection of the public, right? We're gonna protect the public from this bad THC that's, that's out there. You know, and I'm on that boat with you, okay? People get loaded off, to, you know, Whatever, if people want to change the channel and they want to smoke THC, then, you know, you guys have stores for that and regulations surrounding that. But this is something totally different. You know, our intentions are not to have any bit of anything that can get anyone high that we're, we're talking about. Seed, seed oil, fiber. Right. Got and, 30 seconds. Okay. And the biomass is just, you know, part of that. So, so in the day and age when we can separate everything, just it's already separated down a thing, and, you know, if there's an issue and it says, okay, well, you're coming up a little hot. You're a little hot on this thing, okay, so we need to watch this. And so why not just take it down and supervise the extraction, you know, uh, separate it off, destroy the THC, because it, it, this is what, you know how we get paid? We get paid on the percent of CBD, okay? That's how we cash our paycheck. So when they come out and they test that, we don't get paid on any other cannabinoid. Yeah. So the higher CBD in there, that, that's how we get paid. So, um, so whenever that happens, we're the ones already losing, you know, by having THC in there. So um, I'm all for taking it out. Destroy it. That's fine. Take it, let the state take it out and let the state sell it into their own program. Take that money and all fold right. it back in and use it for enforcement. So, okay. All right, now we need right. to Thank hear, hear some other Appreciate people. It. Sorry, but in points. <clears throat> Hiram Euler, um, and I'm in the food business. So uh, I basically, I want to just address your, your sampling issue. And um, you already have a very good system in place right now for sampling, for food. And I don't know why you'd do anything different um, with this as a, a consumable product. You've got people who you hire. I mean, we use labs all the time. So we hire somebody. He is a certified person because they're really, especially on the organic products, very, very interested in chain of command. Or not chain of command, but chain of custody. Same thing with, uh, I can't imagine it's different with THC. You have this system in place right now. You just need to take those people who are already taking samples 
and train them how to take the samples of the CBD or the, the, the plants. This shouldn't be a big issue, <clears throat> I guess, the way that we're seeing it. These people are already available. You hire them. You've got to trust them. It's kind of like this. Everybody that you go and uh, is everyone who's a notary, a uh, state or federal employee, but, then, but yet they're trusted to um, take your signature and say, say that they saw it, right? So you've got to then trust your samplers in the same way. They have to be trained. They have to be licensed and certified, and then they go and they take your samples. Um, you know, one of the things we do a lot is get phytosanitary certificates through the Department of Agriculture. I don't see how these guys are going to be able to go, my ad commissioner and the, and the guys getting the, doing the, these, go out to all the various farms and, and take the um, samples themselves. So my suggestion would be that you look at what's already in place and utilize that system that's already in place for food, organic, for example, and um, let that be your sampling service. Because everyone's, everyone's interested in the same exact thing here, and that is that we have an accurate system. And that's it. Anyway, thanks, guys. Would that be uh, PCAs that you're talking about, or what's the actual person that's doing the Well, a PCA, testing? a pest control advisor, is a person who goes out and prescribes, like a doctor, what kind of drugs you need for your plant so that you can get rid of your pests. No, I'm not talking about that at all. I'm talking about people who... Um, for example, so if I'm going to send a, uh, an organic um, rice product to Europe, they're very, very strict there. So they're going, I have to hire somebody, a sample taker, professional sample taker, who then goes and takes the sample, and they have a chain of command that then goes to a lab, and so they've got this all, it's all documented, right? All you want is your documentation. So who's the sample taker? Um, this particular, you know, off the top of my head, I've got it in an email. I could tell you exactly. Was it but, a state it's employee? A, it's not. It? No, it's not. It's a it's okay. a private company, okay. um, who's you know a fiduciary in this sense, right? To that's trusted by the lab um, to take the sample, and that's the same thing you guys are going to have to. do. You're going to have to get let loose a little bit and trust some people if this is going to work. I mean, you're just going to have to. So, are you talking like somebody like? Somebody from CCOF that's a certified organic certified certified person. Well, I've had um, the people from CCOF. What they're really doing is just really maintaining a paper trail, right? You know, hardcore paper trail. They're not out sampling anything, no. as far as I can tell. They are, um, you know, they're just making sure that you're, you've got your paper in, in place. You've got your three years set aside on your crop property that you can, you know, that you can say that it didn't have any you know, pesticide or, or any non-organic form of nitrogen applied to it. Um, what I'm talking about is somebody who you could hire that, the, that would be a, someone hired by the state or by the county ag commissioner, um, a fiduciary, if you will, to go out and take these samples. Um, the farmer would then have to bear the brunt of the, the sampling cost. I mean, like I have an account right now with the California Department of Food and Agriculture that you go and I put 500 bucks in there every four months, and that's what pays for the sampling from the county, uh, Tehama County in this case, to go look at my rice and say that it's rice. Basically, they say it's wild rice. And you could do the same exact thing, have the farmer put in an account. They then remove that money when they go and sample. I mean, because it, it's going to take longer in different places um, to get there. But anyway, any other questions? It's simple. Thanks. Justin. Hi, uh, my name is Justin Eve. I'm with uh, Seven Generations Producers. We're organic farmers in Sutter County. Uh, I just wanted to confirm, too, that we're on item number six. We've been bouncing around a little bit, this, the sampling responsibilities. Uh, so are, you, are we going to break this into talking about responsibilities now and then, and then talk about the procedures, maybe part of, uh, second part of this conversation? Yeah, I think the, the item right in front of us right now is basically chain of uh, custody. Chain of custody. Yeah, okay. like who's the one who's going to be taking the samples okay. that are out there. So to talk specifically to that, um, it, just to kind of think about what the responsibility of the commission office would be, uh, <clears throat> like in Arkansas, like Don was speaking about earlier, they actually have their own GC machine in-house, in and they're going to be doing their own testing. Um, in the state of California, if you know, I'm not sure if the ag commissioners are really set up to do their own in-house testing because based on chain of custody, that would be the only way to do it and to 
you would actually have to buy the equipment, which is $10,000 or whatever, then you have to train a you know, $75,000 a year employee uh, and then deal with that. Um, so logistically, you know, we have to think about how that's really gonna pass through and then how to charge the farmer back. Now, if you entrust the third party laboratories that are already ISO or whatever certified laboratory based on the state's compliance, uh, then you have that, you know, that other part of that, but you won't be able to control the chain of custody because you're gonna have to allow them to either pick the sample up from directly from the farmer or you're gonna have to have a state agency trade uh, employee to then collect, properly collect that sample, store that sample, and then pass that off to a third party. So it seems like you have two options. If we're just trying to discover THC in the crop, we're not caring about pesticides or anything else, um, then you have two options. A, third party, they come in, they pick it up. If you're worried about chain of custody, then you have to get the commissioner office involved, um, which there's gonna be a storage locker and those things. Or the other option is you just let them take it, and then you just trust the fact that they're a qualified laboratory. Uh, and you really just have those two options. But option of controlling that and testing that, you have an employee, you have to buy the machine, you have to storage, all these things the department is going to be responsible for. The other half of that is you just allow the third party to take that. I don't believe that the CDFA is really set up to being hold, holding and storing uh, any amount of uh, cannabis-derived product, uh, plant material, uh, within the department. So I think that it's pretty straightforward if you really look logistically what it's gonna take to, to take that sample and hold it and test it in-house or to take that sample and then pass it off to a third party uh, just based on the fact you're trying to discover a THC. So logistically it sounds like, you know, those are the two options to weigh those out. Thanks. Thank you, Jessica. Uh, next person. I just kind of going to reiterate what uh, was just said a little bit, but uh, so in the in the the uh, BCC regulated cannabis market, the labs have to have an employee trained in sampling goes out. We have a chain of custody has to the farmer and the and the lab employee have to be there at the same time. The the both you know the lab employee does the sampling chain of custody is filled out. Everybody that gets it in our lab has to sign off with their own initials that they're handling that sample. All of that gets reported to the BCC. Uh, it's all under video, you know, that kind of stuff. So there's ways to ensure that the chain of custody is, remains intact. Even crime labs often subcontract when they have an uh, overload of, of work, not so much in California, but in So countries. with uh, the marijuana thing, the, uh, the BCC does not send their own people to collect. They it. do not, but I can, you might talk to John Young, uh, Yolo County Ag Commissioner. So uh, about a year and a half, almost two years ago, we did a pilot program for Yolo County. They opened up to one acre cannabis uh, farms and they had a bunch that registered and John Young's people went out and did the sampling and we got the contract to be the lab. Uh, that wouldn't necessarily have to happen that way, but I don't know how else that happens if you have, you know, the Ag Commissioner deciding which labs the farmer can pick from or I don't know how you give the farmer the choice. Certainly, uh, I would go with, you know, farmers having the choice to go where they want to. All right, thank, thank you, Tom. Yeah, hello, my name is Jeremy Keurig. Uh, the ODA last year did all the testing for Oregon. This year, there was too many farmers for them to successfully be able to execute that. So they did allow us to, you know, get certified labs and they do come out and they do random testing. Um, so they, you know, they have the whole chain of custody for the entire time. They collect it, they test it, they run it. Um, it seemed to work. I mean, you know, they had no choice. They didn't have the infrastructure or the people to, to accommodate all the farms. So I think going forward, um, I think you guys need to be realistic and, um, you know, try to design it so it'll work because, you know, we're here to make money. We're here to try to grow medicine. We're not here to try to fool anybody, you know, and we don't want to grow. Like he said, we don't want to grow hemp that has too much THC. It makes it harder for us to process it. I mean, even if it's under 0.3 and we process it into oil, it goes above the 0.3. So then we have to mitigate that. 
And so I think, um, I think there needs to be a provision or a new thing that allows for higher testing or higher results in the field. And then you guys keep us to our point three when it goes to the consumers. Because, you know, you don't have the right cult enough cultivars that have the right genetics. You don't have the, uh, you know, the testing things in, you know, in the field that are accurate. So there's all these gray areas and all these things we haven't figured out. So I think there needs to be a temporary provision in the law that allows the farmers to be over point, you know, three in the field or point one and then, or one percent. And then once we harvest it, we can remediate it or deal with it. So, I mean, you know, if you guys are going to be so strict on the farmers, we're going to fail. I mean, I'm taking all my seeds to Australia. I'm not even going to grow them in California, you know, and uh, that's a lot of lost revenue for California. Thank you. Uh, well, you know, that is the biggest problem, uh, especially, you know, the whole entire branch should be taken. The, everything should be, all be dried and homogenized, uh, not just the flower. Uh, but they do, uh, they do a cross-grid pattern. They do a diagonal through the field. You know, they get all the angles because, you know, we might not necessarily have the same genetic in every part of the field. You know, we might have five different genetics. So, they, you know, they do a random thing to try to get an accurate, you know, somewhat accurate. But... I think that all the states need to have their own mobile test labs that show up at the farm. You know, you guys need to invest in some equipment and have a Mercedes van with some really nice equipment and, and test the stuff, you know? Like, why do we have to, there's machines that can tell you right away. We don't have to wait two weeks or two months, you know? Like, you know, I don't know. That's what I think. Why don't we, we have our next uh, person who wants to speak, uh, okay. next gentleman. And then we're going to have to take a break at uh, 12 o'clock. Very briefly here, G.V. Ayers with General Rivers Consulting. Uh, I, think, uh, I think actually the, the goal probably would be to move to something such as Hiram Aller, Euler uh, pointed out earlier there. I think that's the exact place where you need to be eventually. However, going into it, you may have to have uh, the Ag Commissioner take give the Ag Commissioner the ability to take a strong hand in it, as, as, as the Tehama County Ag Commissioner recommended last time. And then, but you don't want it to, to throttle production. So then give them the ability to, uh, to have someone else or to allow someone else to take sampling as well there. But eventually, as, as farmers and the state and Ag Commissioners get used to what we're doing, and what, what what they're doing, eventually it's going to come to a place to where you can have you can have a certified person, certified bonded person come and do it. I would imagine there, but at this point coming in, there may be as trust issues and and setting it up, there may be some more oversight by the ag commissioners needed. Just my thank you. We have another commenter. Uh, I'm Wake McDaniel, <coughs> Sutter County. That uh, I come from racehorse, I still train racehorses, and so does Mary. And she's the one that brought up the split. It's what we have at the racetrack. We have a urine test and we have a blood test, and they do a split on the blood. That's what she was talking last month when she brought it to the. And I think that they should have two tests, send them two labs. And if they test positive, them splits, we have the option to send it to a different lab, and you'd have four labs to test that crop. You know, that, uh, like I say, everybody here, we're, we're being <clears throat> put down in destroying our whole crop on a $200 test. I mean, come on, what's four or $500? We got a million dollars in the field. Uh, give us a split, give us four lab tests if we need be, go to arbitration instead of destroying that crop. Yeah, so before we move on, so there's been a lot of questions about the sampling procedures that have already been discussed by the board. And so what we're going to do is we're going to uh, track that down, print out copies for the board, and bring them up after lunch. Um, so that way we can kind of enhance this discussion, make sure we're all talking the same language. We would recommend, you know, if we're done with comments, it might be a good time to break for lunch and let us start that process and come back in about an hour. It might give people a head start on the lines and the lunch and the restaurants around the area. Quite a few. I have, I have one more, one more uh, comment to make before we break. Uh, since uh, there 
are two tests that would have to be involved prior to uh, destruction. I would put out maybe the first test and be done between the farmer and the uh, designated laboratory. If that one fails, then the second test could involve the uh, county agriculture commissioner. It's kind of a compromise with it, but just something to think about before we go to break. All right, so why don't we take a break? Uh, we'll come back at uh, 1 o'clock. All right, we'll get back at 1 o'clock, everyone.